Warning. The following podcast contains two morons talking about sophisticated subject matter, like ninus and hoo-hahs. Also, a few whoopsie-daisies and at least one house or ante. If you don't have a strong stomach, you know where the door is. Right. On with the shenanigans, then. The podcast which you are about to hear is an account of the tragedy which befell two washed-up losers. In particular, Court Psyops and his immature co-host, Matt. It was all the more tragic in that they were uncultured morons. But had they lived very, very full lives, they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see each week. For them, an idiotic podcast show became a nightmare. The events of each week were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, Cinema Psyops, with Court and Matt. What is Psyops? Psyops for psychological operations is very simply the art of influencing how people feel and think and ultimately how they behave and what they do. You don't have to defeat the enemy on the battlefield. It's better if you can convince the enemy to do what you want him to do without having to fight him. And that's really the intent behind Psyops, to convince people to do what you want them to do. So how does PSYOPs fit into what's happening now? The two points I'd like to make with you and the audience is that, first and foremost, PSYOPs save lives. The second thing I'd like to say, a lot of people have misconception about PSYOPs. They think it's something devious and brainwashing. say you don't know exactly what's going on right now, but we do know that there are some psyops going on, right? Ma'am, I don't know. Cinema psyops. And I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. Why I believe that is because I know how it feels. I know what it does to you. Cinema psyops. They think it's something devious and brainwashing. Welcome to the 284th consecutive week of Cinema PsyOps. Oh, fucking hell do I have to pretend like I'm fucking excited. Anyway, I'm your host, Court, and this is my co-host all the way across the city of Omaha, Matt. Hi. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Two more days. (laughs) I'm just, I'm so fucking fatigued, man. (laughs) Right? How you doing? You sound tired over there. You all right? (laughs) Yeah, I'm playing it up, but yeah, I'm, Yeah. I'm a bit worn down. Uh, I, oh, was, I, I, I was I uh, was watching uh, the Lone Wolf and Cub series. I'm the second movie in on this watch. Uh, Lone Wolf and Cub was cut up a bunch to make Shogun Assassin here in the States. And then it's gotten a full-fledged release on Criterion. You can also see it on HBO Max if you want. And at some point in time, my lack of carbs kept me from staying awake during it. And I kind of dozed off till you messaged me that you were ready to go. So, oh, really? Yeah, so I'm fresh from a nap. <laughs> Jesus, I'm all well, re- I'm all rejuvenated in theory, but now I got to figure out where the fuck I was in the the movie. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 because you fell asleep during it. Yeah, I guess uh, like diabetics have that happen a lot too. If you can't have carbs, like your body doesn't want you to stay awake, so you just end up passing out like all the time. I used to like never be able to sleep, but being on keto, I like randomly fall asleep like I'm my fucking grandpa at Thanksgiving. Yeah, you know, it's so weird. I'll just randomly fall asleep, too. Now, my doctor calls it passing out from alcohol consumption, but I don't believe him. (laughs) It's a long way to go to make a joke about you being an alcoholic. Everybody knows that already. Well, yeah, but I mean, come on. It felt good. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, brother. So, Death Race 2000. Have you seen it before? I have not. Oh, wow. So, this was a first-time watch for you. It was a first-time watch for me. Jesus, you're so many of these, like, horror films that you have seen, though, that it kind of shocks me that you haven't seen this one. Well, I haven't seen it you know, and I almost thought I was—I had seen it because there have been so many movies with the term death race in it that uh, I thought maybe I had. But uh, no, this one I had never seen. Well, it did get a remake with Jason Statham. And then after the Jason Statham, when they had a whole series of death race knockoffs. I think that's the one I saw. Yeah, well, the one with the one. Jason Statham in it. <laughs> Jason Statham. Yeah. <laughs> the one with Jason Statham in it. 
uh, it was like 2008 ish, I think. Yeah. And it was okay as far as yeah. remakes go. It took out all the fun stuff that was in it and just kind of made uh, it like uh, see, that it was I a punishment even... for crimes or whatever. And if you won the races, uh, you got pardoned. It wasn't that great. Uh, and again, I believe I saw it, but I know it wasn't that great because I don't remember. It. Yeah. <laughs> and then there was like a whole bunch of direct to video sequels to that. And I think that the series that spawned off of Jason Statham made it up to like five <laughs> or six of them before uh, Corman's crew took a crack at doing their own. And then there was a Death Race 2050, which really does a great job of capturing the cheeseball, corny, lightning in a bottle, weird satire that is Death Race 2000. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, I, yeah, this is a, um, a surprisingly shorter film. No, it's not that yet, surprising. It's Roger Corman's factory. 79 yeah. minutes was all they could afford. And yet I still got more clips out of this than I have the last few movies. I've been much longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got Screaming Steve from uh, <laughs> Gremlins in this. Uh, yeah. Joe Dante had a lot to do with this. This was back when Joe Dante was still working with Roger Corman. Uh, a it was, Sly Stallone yeah. uh, appearance, too. Yeah, it was one of his earliest roles. Uh, also, Martin Cove, um, <laughs> Crease from fucking Cobra Kai and <laughs> yeah, the Karate Cobra Kid Kai, movies. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. He was in this. This is one of his earlier roles, too. Uh, the thing that I was kind of getting at here is you're going to see a lot of staples of Joe Dante's crew and the folks that worked with Roger Corman ended up being more and more in Joe Dante films. The guy that I'm talking about, the announcer, you, you recognize his voice when you hear him. And I'm sure you got plenty of clips of him because he's like one of the best parts of this film. But he was the radio host Screaming Steve in Gremlins. He also, or no, he was Screaming Steve in the Alan R. Cush uh, movie about the, well, based around the Ramones called Rock and Roll High School. And, oh, okay. Uh, then I I think he was still I think he may have still been called Screaming Steve in Joe Dante's Gremlins uh, but I could be wrong on that but that guy plays like a radio host because of that amazing voice and you, I'm sure you have it as a clip <laughs> I got I got him at least one time as a clip yeah. Junior is his name in the movie yeah and I have him at least once as a clip I know that maybe more <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I'm not all that surprised um, there, we'll get into the actual production stuff a little bit as we kind of get into the movie and everything but Death Race 2000 is something that was on late night cable that I caught like a bunch of different times. And one of my closest friends from high school and I actually bonded over being super sleepy in English class the next day from staying up late to watch Death Race 2000. And we both realized <laughs> that's why we were tired. We had a lot in common. We started hanging out. Yeah, yeah I really want to talk about because I want to talk, not to like, you know, uh, spoil anything, but like one of the things I love is, man, not a lot of like dead space in this movie, which I, I like. Oh, uh, well, I. <laughs> I am sleepy. I am dopey. I am grumpy. I'm about like four or five of the uh, seven dwarfs right now. <laughs> and God damn it. Tell Snow White to get her sweet ass in here. Snow White was an allegory for cocaine. When the seven dwarfs had cocaine, they were able to work quite efficiently. Hi ho, hi ho. Off to work we go. And we're back to gremlins. And I told you, you were never to fucking make music with your mouth again. The way you say it makes it sound so pornographic, by the way, when you say it like that. <laughs> yeah, but like bad pornography, like the kind of pornography of the kink that you're not into and kind of grossed out by. So yeah. when you sing, it's like being forced for you to watch food porn. Oh, porn well, I'm with sorry. actual food play in it. Yeah, that's what it's like for me. Uh, I do apologize then. <laughs> <laughs> But not Finally. really. All right. <laughs> now we're going to take a break. We're going to play the Legion GoFundMe promo. We're going to have a little bit of music that fits in with this 70s vibe of Death Race 2000 because I've gotten not one but two copyright smacks recently from stuff that I Rip. played on the show. Whoops. <laughs> yeah. So, folks, whenever these come out, you better get downloaded and get the release right away if you want the yeah. pure version of it because anytime I get a copyright smack, it just gets like hacked and chewed all the fuck up and spit back oh, on the feed. Oh, no. What was it on? What was it for? Oh, it was like two or three different episodes. Uh, there basically was a thing that I grabbed off of YouTube Literally, that somebody said was royalty free, but it turns out they didn't have do, the right to do say they that. Just, do they just have people who go looking for this stuff? Oh, there's bots that go scrubbing, but we're oh, wasting okay. time. So we'll have a little bit of music right, that fits right. in with the vibe of Death Race 2000. When we come back, we will have the TV spot. This is Bo from LegionPodcasts.com. Hey, it's been a crazy time, and when the world gets nuts, we're happy to offer some old-fashioned podcast entertainment. But for some folks, getting a laugh out of a show isn't really helping these days. People who depend on tips in their bartending jobs or have been put on furlough with no pay till the worst of this coronavirus threat has passed. That's a tough spot. That's why we set up a GoFundMe for members of our community, a sort of grand-scale take-a-penny-leave-a-penny. 
For people like myself, for whom the recent disruptions haven't kicked us out of work, well, we can drop a few of those extra pennies in the GoFundMe jar. For those who are directly affected by recent events and find themselves looking for money to pay the electric bill or keep the water on, well, how about you give me a shout at bo, B-O, at legionpodcasts.com. Let me know the situation and what you need, and we'll do our best to make life a little easier. And you can find links to the GoFundMe on the front page of legionpodcasts.com, on our Facebook group page, or on Twitter at Legion Podcasts, where it's the pinned tweet. For those of you who are able, thanks in advance for chipping in. And members of our community who need a hand, hey, here we are. Remember, stay safe, stay healthy, and we're all going to get through this together. Legion isn't just a name, it's who we are. Thanks for listening to all the shows here on Legion Podcasts, and we'll talk to you soon. from a pre-approved, pre-paid for, licensed website for Legion Podcast Network. So don't copyright at me, bro. Yeah, be fucking cool. Jesus Dicks. fucking Christ. Uh, yeah, I'm getting tired of podcasting. All the fun's being sucked out of it. You can't be like a individual weirdo pirate that just plays whatever fucking music you want anymore because the bots are out there be scrubbing. Fucking, I mean, that is just fucking petty as fuck. Well, the music industry has to try and suck every last penny out of every single one of us for every single thing that we do. And it's not even the artists because they don't see the money. It's all the fucking corporate assholes. That's who's doing it. Ah, so it's Disney. I got you. I got you. That's fine. Yeah, but you know what's definitely not Disney, Matt? What's that? This trailer. Oh, God. The year 2000. America is a vast speedway. People line the streets to witness the greatest drivers on earth in a race from sea to shining sea. This is a death race. You finish first, or not at all. Death Race 2000. Every car a deadly weapon. Every spectator a potential point. It's a cross-country road wreck, and the traffic is murder. Who are you, anyway? The best driver on Earth. I don't want you to die. He was built by the world's finest surgeons to drive the fastest car ever designed, and nothing can stop him now. Death Race 2000, rated R. All right, Death Race 2000. So, uh, we start with our first 20 minutes. We see a big race is getting to happen. They're in a huge, you know, uh, 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 arena. Uh, uh, lots of people are very excited, and we get a guy announcing, and it's our first clip. Oh! great American multitude and sports fans everywhere. Today we inaugurate the 20th annual transcontinental road race. Today, the five bravest young men and women in this bravest of nations will risk their lives in the greatest sporting event since the days of Spartacus. Three days hence, a new American champion will be crowned. For all the world to behold, in awe, in respect, in fear. Oh!
Yeah, that was the guy I was talking about right at the tail yeah. end of that clip. Yeah. So uh, we then start meeting all our racers. Um, we meet Calamity uh, uh, Jane Kelly, who she seems very ready to race. And every racer has a navigator, somebody who will be in the passenger seat of their race car. Do you recognize Calamity Jane from anything? I do not. Okay, that is Mary Warnoff. She first came out of the Andy Warhol factory. I believe she was like a model or something along those lines and did movies and things in the Andy Warhol factory of folks and the creative stuff. And then she ended up doing some acting. She's been in a ton of movies. I mean, we even had her in the movie Warlock that we covered. She was the psychic lady who touches the crystal, gets possessed, and then is, her eyes are cut out in the Warlock with Julian Sands. <laughs> <laughs> so I know hey, Jesus. that's just off the top of my head. One other movie I can think of that we've definitely covered that she's been in, but I'm sure she's been on this show before. Uh, Mary Warnoff and Paul Bartel, the director, uh, end up teamed up together quite a bit, and they usually play husband and wife type couples. Uh, yeah. Including uh, in Chopping Mall. They were together, too. <laughs> <laughs> they were like co-store owners, or I think they were playing their characters for meeting her. Well, it's kind of hard to tell. Anyway, they've been in a bunch of stuff together, but Mary Warnoff is someone you should probably recognize though you may not know her name. All right. Uh, well, then we cut to another racer, and he's being delivered by, like, hospital orderlies, and he's all covered in a sheet. And one of the women reporters there who says everyone's a dear friend of hers, and you'll hear that a lot. Her name is Pandering, uh, by the way. Did you notice that? Her name was what? Miss Pandering. Are you kidding me? No, her last I name was I did not pandering. notice that. Yeah. Uh, ah. The guy pushing the gurney that also talks about the dude on the gurney that's, you know, about to come back yeah. after his cryogenic state, that is uh -huh. Paul Bartell. That is the director of the film, and that guy I was talking about that shows up with Mary Warnoff in a lot of movies. Ah, I gotcha. Well, um, apparently this guy, did, this racer, just got uh, limb transplants, and he rises from the bed, and his name is Frankenstein. And uh, as he walks, he's all kind of, and he's covered up in like this uh, uh, black outfit. It's bondage uh, fucking gear. Bondage gear with a mask, and you can tell it's, everything's kind of fucked up. It's they bondage gear about, with a mask and a fucking cape, yeah. Yeah, they ask about Mr. President, and Frankenstein says that the president president loves all of them so uh then we cut to another racer and she's a nazi uh her name's matilda and her navigator is herman and they're nazis from milwaukee um so the united states is messed up yeah the <laughs> simpsons might be able to predict the future but how fucking prescient is this film from 1975 yeah yeah because yeah i'd be like oh man this version of america's messed up they have nazis and then i remember never mind uh <laughs> Yeah, they have Fuck. open Nazis driving around with vehicles that are running people down for no fucking reason other than just because they can. Yeah, and our that, world that is makes, so different from this movie right now. Yeah, that makes me remember that uh, what our world's like, and then I get sad. <laughs> um, so uh, then uh, Frankenstein, as we said, he's in all black, you know, freaking uh, gimp outfit there. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Oh. Just because it's bondage gear does not mean he's a okay, gimp. It's bondage gear. Fucking Pulp and Fiction makes everybody think that because you're in bondage gear, you be called the gimp. That's not how that fucking works. That's just how Quentin Tarantino put it in a movie. Gotcha. Well, he gets asked about his new robot arm, and he won't comment on that. And they ask him about his new navigator. Well, uh, and he says, hopefully they're good. Uh, and uh, then we get to meet Nero, the hero, who wants all the spotlight and everything, but even his navigator says how much he sucks. So uh, he's apparently not all that great. That is Martin Cove, who we already talked yep. about. Um, yeah, Cobra Kai. Yeah, and I guess Martin Cove decided he was going to play Nero with a bit of a lisp, which is somewhat fitting for Nero if you know your yeah, Roman lore. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it's just kind of interesting the way that they have Martin Cove playing it. And also you can tell that his, his fucking thing looks like it's made out of spray-painted milk jugs, his armor does, and that yeah. had to be really crinkly and very uncomfortable. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, most of this movie looks like it's duct taped and cardboard, like put together with spray yeah, paint. Like, I mean, come on. Do you see the cars they're all in? I mean, all the things are supposed to be so dangerous. Yeah. Well, or just paper mache. We'll get into that a little bit more because yeah. I can actually tell you how the cars were put together <laughs> once we all get right. to more of the car well, action. Frankenstein meets Annie Smith, and uh, she's going to be the new navigator. And it's kind of a tense meeting. Um, 
Then we meet Frankenstein's arch nemesis, Machine Gun Joe, and it's Sly Stallone. Uh, apparently no one likes him because everyone loves Frankenstein, and he hates Frankenstein. Uh, Frankenstein then drives up, and he gets a huge introduction, and, uh, yeah, um, the, uh, president then speaks, and that is in our next clip. My children, whom I love so dearly, it has been my duty in the long and difficult years since the world crash of 79 to serve you as best I could. Never before in history have the masses forgone all comfort so that the spirit of genius might thrive and seek the golden key to a new time of plenty in the fertile field of minority privilege. And now, my children, the drivers are ready, the world is waiting. Once more, I give you what you want. Oh, man, this is hitting way too fucking close to home right now. The the whole thing does. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus fucking Christ. Woo! Can't happen here, Matt. No, that's a dystopian America. Nothing. That wouldn't happen here. Are you crazy, Court? Stop being crazy. <laughs> yeah, I got conspiracy theories all out the wazizzle all about this. Got, what a, You and your crazy conspiracies. Uh, <laughs> so, the race begins, and we get different views of the race, and guys ramming into one another, uh, and then they all kind of go separate roads to try to get to their destination of New L.A. All right, uh, all right it's time to actually talk about the car stuff real okay, quick. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, tell uh, me about the cars. All of the cars were the same stuff. I think he said Volkswagen, I think is what I heard Roger Corman say, but it was like built for race cars. Um, They were all race cars that were, they bought like a used one or something that basically they ran, but they were just kind of on their last leg. And so they already had the frame and everything. They just took all the other stuff off that made it the race car. And then they had someone design it around that look of the race car. The the drawings were all done where they were all designed up. And then they had someone custom build the bodies. Obviously they couldn't put real guns they couldn't put real knives and all that kind of stuff so it's all clearly made out of like fiberglass or sheet metal and you know fiberglass and some stuff carved out of wood and all of that but underneath all of that cheap exterior stuff in those cars and the very clearly badly spray painted scales of frankenstein's monster car yeah um even though all of that is the case underneath all of that is still a fucking race car so when they're driving and you see them going like ultra fast and doing all these crazy turns and all that kind of stuff that they're able to do uh, uh-huh. In some cases, that's actually the actors doing some of that stuff. Oh, nice. They did a lot of their own stunts and things or did their own driving. Now, some of it was sped up to make it look more impressive when you're seeing the actor's face in the frame. But then some of the actual stunt driving that was done by stunt drivers, those cars are going ridiculous amounts of speed and fast and really going after it. And then when they're on open highways and they're taking off and stuff, that's the actual actors driving it in some cases, too. Huh. So they got to drive race cars as part of their pay in this fucking movie. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's got to be kind of fun. <laughs> right? Anyway, go ahead. All right. Um, well, okay. As I said, they were going their separate routes, and that actually goes into our next clip. All right, and hey, 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 the cars have split up. The driver's taking off on their favorite routes. Frankenstein still out in front, headed due west, with Nero the hero on his tail, hoping to pick up his leftovers. Calamity Jane's on a northwest tack. Matilda's buzz bomb is trying to catch up with Machine Gun Joe, now streaking southwest. Once again, Mr. President. I have made the United Provinces of America the greatest power in the known universe. I have also given you the most popular sporting event in the history of mankind. The transcontinental road race which upholds the American tradition of no holds barred. No holds barred. That's how he got to be president. Hypocrite pig, what about our ultimatum? He's been laughing us off for 15 years. Passive resistance means nothing to him. Pick up that flag, young man. It's time for action. It is not a time for violence. Mrs. Payne, I love Annie as much as you do, but she's no match for Frankenstein. And we can't risk letting him get away. Frankenstein is the biggest target in the world and a personal friend of Mr. President's. That Lieutenant Fury is exactly why they'll call off the race. To save his life. My granddaughter will succeed. Don't you ever take off that mask? No. Don't you know about my face? I've heard stories. Nobody's ever seen it, have they? 
except my other navigators. And they're all dead. So they are. They say you lost most of your jaw in the crack of 92. And my right eye in 95. And my nose and my left eye in 97. And most of my cranium in 98. I'm held together with patches of plastic and steel plates. It's not a pretty sight. You want to see? Why not? I've seen everything else. Remember, you're doing this on your own. I take no responsibility. And as she removes his mask, all the scarring we see is fake. That's on his face. There is no injuries or anything else. So he's actually a very normal looking David Carradine. Which is as normal as David Carradine can look. Yeah, it's still fairly disturbing. Yeah. So This is know. fresh off of him leaving the Kung Fu series and having enough. Oh, he really? Goes to do this film, yeah. He had, he'd done a, a few other things, but this was like him essentially attempting to jump into movies and then also just to kill the image of Cain walking the earth and making, you know, things right whenever things go wrong, as Cain has wanted to do very peacefully but we'll still fight uh, and hoping that his next leap will be the leap home kind of only there's no leaping he's just trying to set things right when they and go he also wrong. and he doesn't turn into a big green monster either uh yeah it's another traveling thing anyway so yeah 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 he's fresh off of that he's trying to kill that idea of him as an actor so he took frankenstein in this very weird role where he's wearing bondage gear and all that kind of stuff and he goes and experiments in films and starts doing even weirder stuff but he got paid the most out of anybody to be in this movie he also got points on the back end so probably, he probably was the biggest star right <laughs> at the time yes uh, the yeah. thing that's the thing that's interesting about it is he basically made a million bucks off of being in this film and having the points in the background and then he even this he passed away before or the remake that got put out with the mm-hmm. death race with Jason Statham he was even going <laughs> to get points on that one too because of the uh, remake of it and all of that so he did then okay he making this, yeah <laughs> he uh he did okay making this little silly movie where he gets to drive a car and dress in bondage gear yeah. which the only thing wrong with that outfit is that they're like brass zippers on there and that doesn't look good it's uh, it's got to be silver you got to have that silvery contrast or it's just it's just not kinky enough okay well then while court gets himself put together over there um <laughs> i'm good i'm just mildly disappointed things, in his his bondage gear is all more things in, in that clip you also heard there is a resistance to our uh, Mr. President, and they are talking about how Annie is their uh, uh, is their spy in uh, the uh, Frankenstein's car. So yeah, they so, they got a kidnapping and murder plot where since he's supposed to be best friends with El Presidente, El Presidente yeah. will stop the race in order to save. Frankenstein, and I guess that's their whole goal is they just want the race to not happen anymore. Yeah, and that well, and I think that that's part of it. End the race, and then maybe end Mister President's reign of terror. Yeah, I, you would hope so, but the president's not going to step down just to save David Carradine's character, no matter I how much. I mean, him. It's a, according to the media, though, which they're all still listening to. Yeah, yeah, they will. You know, and at least in their idea. Okay, I just I don't know. I think it's a hastily yeah. put together plot that you know everything about this film is a hastily put together plot because you're not supposed to be paying attention to any of this other than hey look at this neat trick that we just did with the car exactly hey is that another explosion (laughs) right is that more fucking temper paint that looks kind of like it should be blood yeah right so we cut to then machine gun joe he's driving and he finds some road workers the few of them get out of the way but he uses his his car as a front like big fucking sword type thing on the front of it and he drives it right into one of the guy's assholes killing him uh so and apparently that gives him points when you kill people you get points they go through uh, what the points are too and i have that actually oh okay that's that's coming (laughs) frank uh has uh any while frank's driving uh frankenstein i call him frank uh, while he's driving, he has Annie actually go. He goes, uh, the engine's not clicking right. So she has to work on the engine. And as she's doing so, he speeds up. It takes like a dirt road. So she almost slips off. But she's able to fix what he needed to get back in there. He's hazing her. Um, That's what he's doing. He's yeah, hazing pretty her. pretty much. And then we cut to an announcer explaining the point system. And that's our next clip. As the cars roar into Pennsylvania, the cradle of liberty, it seems apparent that our citizens are staying off the streets which may make scarring particularly difficult even with this year's rule changes. To recap, 
those revisions. Women are still worth 10 points more than men in all age brackets, but teenagers now rack up 40 points, and toddlers under 12 now rate a big 70 points. The big score, anyone, any sex, over 75 years old, has been upped to 100 points. As always, how fast you move determines how long you live. Okay, so girls are worth 10 more points than boys on all categories. The younger you go under 12, the higher the points. The older you go, basically the more of a burden you are on society, the more points you are Yeah, I was about to say death. that. Yeah. Did you notice that the ones who get the most points are the ones who have to be taken care of? Yeah. Whoever Babies has to be taken care of. Babies and senior citizens. Right. It's a very fascist regime, regime decision. It's- it's the Republican Party. I mean, they want the baby born, but they don't want to have to care for it. Death Race 2000 is the Trump administration's response to the pandemic. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> That's how the points work. Like, if you're more susceptible to dying or having something horrible happen during the pandemic, that's how much less of a fuck they give about you in that administration. This is 100% all facts. You're speaking <laughs> facts. <laughs> and and that, therefore, how many more points you are worth to get ran over by this yes. converted race car? into this death uh-huh. wagon <laughs> exactly well uh calamity jane she's driving and her car's like uh because she's texan or southern it looks like a bull you know it has the horns on the end of it all that kind of stuff the front of the car and the hood all that well this dude gets dressed up like a bullfighter and he starts doing the ole with the red sheet as she's trying to hit him well eventually she cuts into his leg with one of the horns and then as he's trying to get up she gores him so she gets a pretty cool kill on that one. I wonder if this was sort of like what we see later on where someone wants to give their life specifically to give points to their favorite racer. It um, could be. And I wonder if he this is was... very much dressed like her stuff. Yeah, well, if she's driving like a bull and he wants to play around first, maybe she was letting him have a little bit of fun before yeah. she finally got him. Or maybe they actually were seeing if he could get away from the car. You yeah, know? Maybe he's just also an adrenaline junkie who's like, let's see if I can fucking do this and get away. The other thing I can think of is we see later on where there are traps laid for these racers, and maybe this was a trap that just failed. Possibly. Yeah. I'm going to go along with the fact that I think this guy was just an adrenaline junkie and wanted to take on Calamity Jane. And or was doing a sacrifice in the most adrenaline way possible. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So- then we see old people being wheeled out in uh, being wheeled out in wheelchairs uh, out of a hospital uh, by nurses. Uh, Frankenstein sees this and says, "This is a euthanasia day." And they take all the old people of the geriatric clinics and send them up to be murdered. Uh, they do it every year. Uh, Frank is then driving towards them, but he turns right before hitting the old people and goes through the hospital, like, outside area where they can all hang out and kills a whole bunch of nurses and doctors instead. Yeah, we get this little wicked sense of humor that Frankenstein has yeah. and then also his sense of moral justice. Well, and then he, the, uh, the TV media laugh about it saying, oh, I think Frankenstein's just playing jokes on everybody right now. And, you know, instead of taking the major points, you know, he could have had 700. He only took 100 points. And they're like, I think he's just joking around with us now because he has that wicked sense of humor. And I was like, all right, fine, but, you know, whatever the media needs to do. So, uh, the well, and the, you'll see later on the media is getting orders c- down from on high yeah. about how they need to spin the misinformation and do their Goebbels work. This is true. Yes. Um, the resistance group is watching the operation, uh, or the resistance group is watching and they decide to launch Operation Anti-Race and it's going to begin now. Uh, Nero then sees a family to run over. Uh, he turns in there and the family runs, but they leave their baby behind. His navigator keeps saying, go for the baby, go for the baby. And we see it's all fake. The, the mom, the whole entire group is, uh, part of the resist, or resistance guys. And the baby is a fake doll. And as Nero runs it over, uh, the doll, it, it explodes, killing Nero. And that ends the first 20 minutes. I, this is why I think that maybe the first guy even was a setup. But if they're launching the operation, then that had to be a general and junkie slash sacrificial lamb. Yeah, I think that's why the first guy is that. Because they just now launched the operation for Nero. Uh, Nero was the first. 
Everyone else was that first guy was just yeah what we said an adrenaline junkie or a complete or both both an adrenaline junkie and a complete devotee to Calamity Jane. So you know let's let's have some fun and then she'll kill me and get points. I also kind of find it funny that they lured them in with the trap of the highest point value being a baby. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep. Uh, so the, uh, the whole family that baby's worth the most. So get it. I wonder if they would confirm that it was a girl child because that would give them even like ten more points than. The right. fact that it was a baby. And they would have to try. They'd probably talk to the family. Because as we see, we're going to see here soon, the families of the victims get stuff and are <laughs> supposed to treat it like this is a great day for themselves. Yeah, they win a prize by having their family sacrifice for the transcontinental race game. Yeah. 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 So we start the next 20 minutes, uh, the next 20 minutes, uh, and this is where we get it, actually. The next 20 minutes starts when that female fucking reporter, uh, she Ms. interviews, Pandering. They, it's, yeah, Miss Pandering, she, they actually, like, guards, because they're in Miss Pandering's house, force this woman who's in, like, a bathrobe, who's just crying, to do an interview with her, and we see this is the wife of the very first victim, and apparently she's going to get a brand new apartment and a huge new 3D TV, and the apartment is in somewhere, like, exotic. Right, she's moving on up to in a, San Juan San Juan yeah she's yeah. moving up and up to a nicer locale and getting a better yeah. a better apartment and so and she's, everything. she's she's both crying and smiling because she's trying to be polite on the media because you know she'd probably get murdered if she didn't right and uh but yet it, she's gonna get all this stuff but yet you know her husband's dead <laughs> see this is what I don't believe that she actually loved her husband enough to where she's sad that he's gone so much so that getting a brand new apartment in a sunny locale is not gonna make her feel better and be happy well but she's crying a lot so that's what I'm saying <laughs> yeah I don't think she loves her husband I you know I, I just it's a pessimist <laughs> <laughs> no it's 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 clearly that they need to do this for the satire aspect of it where she's gonna have this wonderful sort of sort of like glorious life with this yeah. apartment in you know San Juan, and if the family members get set up, I can see where some folks would sacrifice themselves to have their family taken care of. <laughs> but it's just, it's so over the top, and it's supposed to be so over, like just so ridiculous and over the top. But you get to the point where, as you're watching this, you realize the last four years of your life in this fucking shithole of a country, <laughs> and it's just like, <laughs> no, this isn't that far fetched anymore. This is this is my new reality. This is uh, what four more years of Trump would have been. <laughs> Well, just then, the resistance actually breaks in and has their own announcement. And that's our next clip. The execution of the barbarian killer Nero the Hero is the people's first stroke against the evil and corrupt regime of Mr. President. I am Thomasina Payne, founder and commander of the Army of the Resistance. Americans have been told when to eat and when to sleep, when to love and when to hate. The age of obedience is over. In the names of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Harry Truman, I call upon you to stand up for your inalienable rights. We declare war upon the bipartisan party on Mr. President and on that most inhuman desecration of life and liberty, the transcontinental road rape. Did she say rape at the end there? That's what I heard. Yeah. I think she was trying to say race, and for some reason, rape just got pushed in there. All the drivers hear this, and they keep asking for confirmation about what's happening, and they can't get anything. They don't know, like, the, everything's being explained. They're like, we have no information at this time, no information at this time. So, uh, Annie then asked Frank if he is worried, and he said the only thing he's worried about is winning, and that this actually makes the race a little bit more interesting. Uh, then we see there are two guys, they're building a barricade to hide behind and as they hear a car coming they're like oh shit you know we better we better get you know behind this barricade and they get behind it but uh, actually the nazi lady comes from up behind them and runs them both over killing them uh the racers are all kind of coming back together from their side roads and they're all coming into st louis where they're gonna have an overnight pit stop uh machine gun joe uh he sees guys uh setting up uh uh frank uh frankenstein banner and he drives by, and one guy's kind of hiding behind a pole, so he's safe. He knocks another guy off the ladder, asks the other guy what he should do, and the guy says, kill him. So he says, all right. And always listen to the fans, and he runs over the guy's head. Uh, the racers are now all in, uh, they're all in St. Louis, and they're all getting rubbed downs. And that's our next clip. One thing before we begin. 
The government would like it if nobody said anything about Nero. Understand? He hit a tree and that's it. Got it? We don't want to depress anybody by... Hey, hey. Everybody knows he was blown up by the resistance, you schmuck. It was on television. If you want to drive again next year, Mr. Viterbo, you'll keep those opinions to yourself. Okay, go ahead. This is Grace Pander from St. Louis, where Matilda, a dear friend of mine, is receiving a well-deserved rubdown. Tell me, Tilly darling, what can we expect from you when the cars go back on the road? You can expect a victory by a member of the master race. <laughs> A woman. <laughs> oh, Tilly, darling. That certainly is showing a lot of confidence for someone who's lying fourth out of four. He doesn't mind as long as she's lying somewhere. Look, when I'm through with you, you're going to be lying in state, lady. Listen, miss, if anybody is going to Boot Hill, it's you and your biz bag. Buzz bomb. Shut up. Look, you just leave my navigator alone. <laughs> girls, 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 remember you're on TV land. <laughs> Pete, how do you like being a navigator? Well, Junior... I'd like it more if I was in the driver's seat. You'll get what's coming to you on the road. Oh, yeah? Well, what's coming to me is the final solution to the cowgirl problem. Frankenstein, can you tell us when you're going to make your move? Are you going to take any off-road chances for scores? Or are you driving all out to be first in the new L.A.? It's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. Frankenstein, a dear friend of mine. Frankenstein, tell me how it feels when at that electric instant, driving at 200 miles an hour, life and death coexist at the moment of scoring. You stand in the middle of Route 66 tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, and you can answer that question for yourself. I would like to bring up at this point, everyone's nude, except for, you know, the reporters and shit, and, and Frankenstein, but everyone's getting their massages very nude. Yeah, this so. was a very purposefully produced tits and ass scene. Yeah, but and, so, thank you, movie. Yeah, uh, I wanted to point out, too, that uh, Stallone got very pissy about showing his ass in this scene, and Roger Corman basically was arguing with him, saying, this is a, my tits and ass shot, this is what I need to sell this film, this is gonna happen, so he got naked but they gave him a towel across his ass and he was kind of the only one that was really all that covered and we almost had a nude fight between the Nazi lady character and Mary Warnoff's uh, cowgirl character almost but then pandering calmed them down and wouldn't let them do it and I'm a little disappointed because Roger Corman probably would have really liked to see them go at it and roll around on the floor naked fighting I, I, I would have <laughs> I mean I would have enjoyed it I still love what I got with just a little bit of a, a tease of a scrap yeah. that was going to happen um, that was very fun and entertaining you know but pretty much everybody's naked there's all the eye candy you could possibly want because roger corman knows what you want to see in a film yes yeah roger corman he's he's like i'll help you i'll help everybody <laughs> yeah um, bush and beefcake yeah pretty much that's what he's gonna give you so frankenstein stops by the uh machine guns navigator and he starts talking to her and she's like you can't talk to me you know he'll you know he'll get machine gun will get all pissed and he goes just tell him i whispered sweet nothings into your ear and then he leaves and so all the media comes up asking her what did frankenstein stay say to you and so does uh machine gun he's like what happened and she goes oh he told me to tell you, you whispered sweet nothings in my ear uh and then machine gun closed fist punches her in the face she so. got it wrong and kept saying something about nothing sweet. He was whispering nothing sweet in my ear or something. Yeah. She got it all confused because she's supposed to She was to all be, flustered. Yeah, she's supposed yeah. to be ditzy and dumb as well. And then Joe punches her in the face. Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> that's not cool. But anyway, uh, so... Um, a fan, then Frankenstein leaves and he meets with a fan. And she's like, you know, I just want you to know I love you and we all love you. We understand you and your pain. And he's like, what do you want? You want to give me your body? And she goes, no, because she was even talking about how that's disrespectful to his uh his current navigator so apparently navigators are supposed to be also boning their drivers so there you go there's that <laughs> yeah um, that's what they're there for they're to you know provide sexual relief on the nights that they're recouping between days of the race yeah that's their whole yeah, thing that's supposed to be the the whole deal i guess so she says no um but uh she does say that uh, she does love him and that uh they understand him and they appreciate him and all that so he leaves and that he's 
their hero. So then Frankenstein walks in and he and Annie uh, start talking and apparently she gave Machine Gun some bad intel on what their directions were going to be heading out. She did that on purpose. Uh, then he, Frankenstein strips down so he's just in a pair of briefs. Uh, he dances with Annie a little bit and then they bone. So, you know, good for them. Yeah, he uh, is our main character that we're following. And she is the heroine of the film, I would say. Yeah. So, yeah, we get to watch them go at it. Well, it's over quickly. (laughs) The next day, it is time for the race to continue. All the racers are getting ready to race, and Frank drops his one of his gloves. And then all the racers takes off, and Frankenstein starts to circle back right as that deacon who kind of announced all the races, uh, like the, the very the, my first clip guy. He comes down and he's all like pomficating about Frankenstein. He picks up the glove, or he's getting ready to, and Frankenstein runs it over and kills him. And the judges talk, and Frankenstein still gets fifty points for it. So there you go. That's nice. Not only does he hit him and kill him, but he gets the glove back in the process. Yes. So, I mean, hey, good for everyone. I mean, except for that one guy. That that's a that's that good for him. <laughs> he's he's very dead. Um, you get the feeling so, that he did something that Frankenstein felt he deserved. This well, he sounds like he's just a part of the fucking whole thing. And Frankenstein hates everyone. Yeah, he's trying to take down the whole system his own way by running everybody over with his car. It's like yes. Rollerball, only lower budget and even more sleazy. Yeah, well, but it's a good time. <laughs> Because, you know, we like low budget and sleazy. Um, so, uh, okay, so then they're driving, and then we see a bunch of Frankenstein fans. They all have Frankenstein shirts on. They're all on the road. And they see the car coming, Frankenstein's car, so they all get off the road, except for there's the woman who had talked to Frankenstein the night before. She's now in a white gown. She sits there, and Frankenstein runs her down. And when uh, Anne asks why she would just stand out there like that and take that hit, Frankenstein says, said she did it to prove to him that she loved him. So holy shit, man! That's that's a uh, that's uh, the, the, those are some rabid fans. <laughs> she did say she was offering her body to him. He was getting pissy yeah. about it because she was trying to be cryptic about how she was going to offer to kill herself and get him give him points. But he was like, I don't want your body like trying to make it like you're way too young. This is not right. Get away. You're not you're not going to have sex with me. You know, is basically yeah. what he was saying. And she Pretty was like much. trying to say, I'm going to sacrifice my life so that you can gain points from my death. Yeah. <laughs> and she did. Uh, so, I mean, hey, listen, <laughs> even she, dressed she, her she, in she... all white, like a wedding gown outfit, like. Where she is wed to him forever by giving him points for her life. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it's like, hey man. dude, why didn't he swerve away from her and hit all the other fans? Because it's a lot of girls. He would have gotten a lot of points for all those ladies. Well, I, I, I guess he uh, doesn't feel like hitting people who aren't on the road. <laughs> I guess. But uh, again, I have no idea. What, what. Listen, you can't really inflect reason in this movie. <laughs> Yeah, there's no real um, logic. It's just stuff is happening, yeah. and you don't have time to pay attention as to what actually is going on. If you really wanted a ton of you want a ton of points where they were taken off of, there was a bunch of people watching them. <laughs> Why not just drive right into them and start killing people? Right, that's what I would do. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then we see that three dudes are going to play chicken with the cars, and they're right by like a a, a manhole, like a, a hole to a sewer, a manhole, and they're sitting there, and they see the cars coming. One jumps in, another jumps in, and the other one who jumped in puts the man cover back so the third tries to jump in realizes he's standing on the man cover goes uh oh and he gets hit by calamity and killed the two others poke their heads out of the manhole cover to see and they get ran over by machine gun this was a great sequence it's real yeah. cornball it's real like looney tunes only with actual blood involved yeah right uh, yeah. yeah you just you almost wanted to hear yakety sax play at that point no it should have been some kind of like how chuck jones would have done it with like classical music where like they're sneaking off to the pizzicato strings you oh know? Yeah, yeah and then like the Good. big orchestra hit happens and that's where they get ran over and blood goes spraying everywhere that's what i'm picturing um so anyway then uh machine gun he argues with himself about taking that detour or about that shortcut that annie had told him about and at the very last moment he decides to take that route um, then we see uh, Annie convinces Frankenstein to drive over, and there's like this compound of congressmen, and she convinces him to go there and kill them all for points. Yeah, uh, it's so he- uh, former congressmen that are now like in a prison camp, yeah. and they're all the right age to where they would be worth a lot of points, apparently. Yes. So 
I guess there you go. Uh, good luck. <laughs> good luck, Congressman. Although, I mean, just hide in a building. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> no, I think because they're prisoners, they're let out there to be executed uh, because they're no longer worth. They can't. Uh, they're, yeah. not, they're in work camps or whatever. But if they're not able to physically work, they're dead. I gotcha. What, yeah, that makes sense. At least that's what it seems like she was inferring. Like if she get if he gets there first, he'll get all those points. Yeah. Well, he uh, so he agrees and uh, they start driving that way. Um, then we see the resistance is planning. And they're going to set a trap trap for Frankenstein, and then replace him with a uh, with a copy. Uh, so then Frankenstein he goes and he runs right into the trap, and but he gets through their barrier and their fire, and he drives around and he sees the guy dressed like him, and he says sorry, brother, and runs him over, killing him, and then drives off. And uh, then we see the end that 20 minutes machine gun on this route. Apparently the road sucks. It's really bumpy and he is pissed. So that's uh, that's how that 20 minutes ends. Yeah, they go nowhere with that because she led him to a dead end on purpose. And that's where we know he's headed. And it's also yep. supposed to be a rough ride. So it's going to fuck up his car. And that gives everybody else more time to do whatever they're going to do. And it's clear that Frankenstein knows he was just set up in this last sequence. And oh, he yeah. narrowly escaped the trap. And he's like not even pissed about it. It's weird. Yeah, it's um, he's he he's got a weird disposition right now, uh, going on with this whole because he knows something's funky is going on, uh, and uh, he knows that he is being set up somehow. He just doesn't know why yet. Oh no, I think he knows it all. I think. Do you he, think he knows it all? He figured it out right here. Yeah. And, oh, okay. And I'll tell you why I think he knows it all later on. Um, but I think he figured it out right here, and he knows what's going on. But I think he's going to use this also to his advantage because he's got his own schemes and plans that we can see are clearly being unfolded in this race. Yes, yes, one, he does. One in- way or another, this is his final race to him. Like, you can see that yeah. he's, he's going for gusto and trying to make it as much fun as possible. This is true. Yeah, he is definitely, uh, he definitely doesn't fucking care right now. And he's got his own shit going on. Yeah. Um. So we start the next 20 minutes, Frankenstein and Anne, they're talking about who could have set them up. And he, he keeps bringing up people and Anne keeps giving all these people, no, it could have been this person. Couldn't have been that. And he goes, you're right. You're right. He then stops the car and looks at her and says, you're going to drive. So she has to drive the car for a bit. Machine gun comes up and he realizes he's completely lost. And he asks a local for directions to uh, uh, Albuquerque. Well, he and also guy, comes up to the end of the road because the road's all broken off. And then there's a yeah, stream yeah, that washed out the bridge. Yeah. And uh, he comes up and he asks a local and the local's like, um, I'm sorry, man, you're best bet is to go all the way back to the highway and he's like yeah it's like 45 minutes out of his way to try and go yeah. back to the and highway he's like, what and he is pissed and then the guy tells him well you know i'm just your biggest fan he goes i've i've i have posters of you everywhere i just love you so much frankenstein and that of course uh pisses uh uh machine gun off and he tells him he's gonna kill him so he chases the guy and finally catches the gun looks like at one point the guy might get away but he catches up to him and then just speeds all over his dick with a tire uh that that appeared to be painful <laughs> the blood spurting out on that was pretty awesome uh, yeah the way they did that is they had a stunt man there um like a stump down in the ground to keep the car from hitting the stunt man and then it just spun out on a blood bag you know what that makes sense yeah <laughs> that was a cool fucking shot that was gross and really neat <laughs> i made the yeah. joke earlier about the blood looking like tempera paint i just want to point out that's just how it looked in films in the 70s even dirty harry which had a significantly bigger budget than this its blood still looks like tempera paint it's because they used stage blood and the film color timing back then was too pastel and it just didn't make it look realistic enough oh okay so is that why they did that yeah it was it was all stage blood but stage blood looks very opaque and paint like in a ton of these movies it's every Every fucking 70s movie practically has that. There's very few movies where they get the blood right. And Herschel Gordon Lewis was kind of the first in the late 60s. And he was in super low budget stuff. So (laughs) it just so happened that he did color timing and testing to make sure that it looked great on the film he was shooting on. And he came up with his own formula. Oh, well, there you go. That helps. Yeah. Herschel Gordon Lewis was the man. So then uh, we see Calamity and her car is broken down. Her navigator's like working on the underneath part of it. I have his body's laying on the road. And the Nazi sees it and runs over her navigator, killing him. So, sorry, 
about your damn luck. Do you think that should Shit. be extra points if you kill a fellow racer or navigators? I think so. Yeah, I think so too. Like if, but then they're competing not against each other, but to kill each other as well. And that's more like what you end up seeing in the Jason Statham death race movie. <laughs> Jason Statham. Um, let's see. So Calamity, then she gets pissed and gives chase to the Nazi, and they're driving through shit, and uh, she, they, they drive through mud, and Calamity kind of spins out, but she's able to recover. Get it's right on her ass. They're all, you know, they're doing this chase. Then we see some guys. They're setting up a fake detour sign. When the Nazi sees it and she takes it, and right as she turns, it takes her right off a cliff with her and her car lands exploding. <laughs> Calamity sees it and she sees that all happen, so she knows not to, you know, get involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she basically messed up. she turns off to the side and basically sees the the crash happen. Yeah. We've reached peak Roadrunner at this point for how they pulled this off and it worked. Yeah, it was literally a sign. Yeah, I mean, it was a sign. They almost they almost drew like the train tracks through a wall and then ran through it and then they hit the wall. Yeah, it was so fucking close to Roadrunner and fucking Wiley e. Coyote shit. But it was yeah. hilarious and I love that it worked and that's how the Nazi died as she lived a dumb fucking asshole yes she's dead now we don't have to deal with the dumb fucking nazi <laughs> yeah i mean the only good nazi is a dead nazi so that is a goddamn fact <laughs> <laughs> and anybody who says different is an idiot <laughs> i believe the word you're looking for is sympathizer mm. all right so uh then we see the news is going to report on this but then they're given a different story to say that Actually, uh, the Nazi lady is alive and well and found a new way to kill somebody, apparently. So, yay, everything's fine. The, the, the government definitely does not want to let out that the drivers are getting just handled right now. <laughs> yeah, there's only three drivers of the five left. Yeah. So these shit are all, ain't cool for these folks. This is, these are all supposed to be super strong, you know, or super deadly people, and they're getting taken out. So <laughs> By ridiculous, implausible, stupid fucking cartoon pranks. Ugh. But it's it's like it's like if Home Alone had a darker tone to it. <laughs> yeah, it's like better watch out. Yeah, it's like these improbable pranks are stopping these fucking god you know god tier people. Um. Uh. So then we cut to we see Annie is still driving and we see this kids on the road pushing a tire and she's make believe like she's gonna kill him but she misses on purpose. But uh, it, you know the and I think you know we all see Frankenstein knows she missed on purpose. But Frankenstein, ah, oh, you missed. He goes first one's you know it's always hard. It takes technique and takes practice, all that kind of stuff. And she goes, it, it, does it ever get any easier? Or she asked until it gets totally easy, right? And he goes, it never gets easy. So it's almost like Frankenstein has a different way of thinking. Like, hey, you know, this isn't always the right thing to do. Yes, <laughs> and I believe that his suspicions were confirmed by her actions in. The- this. Yeah, and I think it's why he he takes a liking to her too, because well, and he's seems- he's also just going to see where this goes by letting her drive anyway, because he was already suspicious of her, and he wants to yeah. see what she does when he just forces her to drive. Exactly. So, um, then, uh, you know, they talk about how far away they're from this compound and she's kind of talking. He can tell she's bullshitting. So he has her stop the car. He has her get out and he gets back in the driver's side seat and he tells her to go around front of the car. As she goes around front, he's obviously making it look like he's going to hit her with the car and he, uh, he questions her and she finally admits that the compound that she's taking him to, well, it's actually in Japan. So he has her get back into the car seat and, um, he asks, like, what the hell were you, are you thinking? What are you doing? She goes, like, what were you thinking with that setup back there? And she said they were going to force the president to end the race in exchange for his life. Uh, so now at the end, they all reach Albuquerque. Uh, they have a little party as that, uh, news lady is talking about the Nazi lady's death and saying how sad it is and that there will be a special announcement by the president. Um, then during a dinner, uh, which Cy Stone's character is just a fucking mess. It's, uh, <laughs> It's really unbelievable. Uh, he's like constantly has shit all over his face. Yeah, um, he's eating with his hands, including his mashed potatoes, and he's just being as disturbingly gross as possible. Yes. And it's because Stallone is the heavy in this. He's supposed to be the really bad guy. He's the one that loves to hurt people, and he's got a seriously thin skin, and he hates that nobody loves him, and he's just even more pissy and narcissistic as fuck, and he's President Trump. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's... Um... As, as a driver, and that's all he has, the best he can do is second fiddle to someone he can't stand so he's constantly a narcissistic wound 
God damn. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, he is definitely Trump. So anyway, a government official tells all the drivers uh, uh, that they will not come clean that it's rebels. And the drivers are all kind of getting pissed at the guy because they're like, they're killing us really easily. We should get like extra shit for it. Well, Frankenstein is asked by two other officials to talk separately without anybody. And they're talking to him about the ambush he uncovered. They asked if it was him or his uh, navigator who had him take that road. And he said it was his idea to try to take that road. So he, he covered for Annie because Annie, it was her idea. Um, so then uh, we see the president. He makes his statement about these murders. And that is our next clip. There has been a lot of talk about American rebels. We have positive proof that it was none other than the treacherous French who have been sabotaging our great race, just as they and their stinking European allies have undermined and destroyed our great national economy. It is no coincidence, my dear children, that the word sabotage was invented by the French. Where's Annie? I don't know. Hey, did you hear the news? The Mr. President said it was the French who knocked off Nero right. and Matilda. Gallant heroes. Watch out for the creeps, Suzette. Calamity Jane Kelly, Machine Gun Joe Viterbo, and Frankenstein as they begin the last lap of their long and difficult journey toward new Los Angeles. It's always the French, man. It's always the French. Those damn Frenchies, I tell you. I love the way that he explains it away by saying they are the ones who invented the word saboteur. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's insanity. But hey, listen, it never happened here where we just blindly believe a president for no fucking reason, right? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Just lying his ass off to try and cover up his national shame. That'll never happen here. No, I mean... Listen, man, you don't, yeah, I mean, come on, we're, oh, fuck, I really hate it here. <laughs> I'm just so fucking tired, can this all just be over soon? I, 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 yeah, I know, it's it's almost over. The long national nightmare is almost over. <laughs> so anyway, um, Annie is then checking out the car, almost like she wants to do something to it, before Machine Gun shows up, and he's angry about her trickery. Well, he starts choking her, and he's going to choke her to death when Frankenstein walks in. They fight, and Frankenstein whoops the living shit out of him. Uh, this was the Frank- only thing in the movie that I completely did not believe, because there is no way David Carradine was throwing punches that could put Sly down. <laughs> no, 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 no. That that That's where it's all acting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because th- I was not believing this action, like, at all. <laughs> no, why would you? I mean, that's horse shit. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, Sly's not even the biggest that, you know, he's not even, like, his rocky fighting weight in this movie. He's still built, though. He's still looking pretty good. And it still-, still seems like he's a tough guy. Right. And I just do not believe that r- wiry, thin little David Carradine's going to come in here and do his fucking uh, shit. Just beat the fuck out of him. Yeah, and he's purposely not doing his kung fu tai chi moves that he knows from kung fu because he's trying to get away from that he's trying to like fist to cuff it out and he's trying to slobber knock this fight and it just does not work no he's um he's gonna get his ass whooped in a very serious way so (laughs) yeah but not in this movie no somehow he's the hero and he makes it happen he would yeah typically he would get an ass whooping of epic proportions yeah it would not be a good thing to see it would be a very gruesome disproportionate fight yes it would and it would just be rocky going hey i did it again (laughs) whoa so i found something even more offensive than you trying to make music it's me trying to do the rocky impression right (laughs) Hey, Adrian, what are you doing? So, let's see here. All right. So then uh, Frankenstein brings Annie back to the room, and they he questions her as she starts to just undress. Thank you, movie. Uh, yeah, we got to won't... see way more of uh, her in this scene than we have anywhere else in the movie. Yeah. He says he won't turn her in because she's in – actually, she's no danger to him is what he she, he says. Um. He also says that the world doesn't want to be saved, and he goes, but she can save something. She can save herself, and he can help. He says he was brought up in a government center, and that he's not even the original Frankenstein. There's been a new Frankenstein every race. That's why the mask and all that. 
Uh, he was raised for only one reason, one reason only, and that it was to win this race. Uh, and then uh, they start to get down, and uh, she asks him why he won't remove one of his gloves, because he never does. He says, because it's his secret, and that ends that 20 minutes. So, so they just get down. Frankenstein's umper or Palpatine, then. He's just a bunch of fucking clones. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's, a, he's, he's, a, he's a clone trooper. That's uh, that's fact. <laughs> 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 Only he can actually hit shit. Well, no, the clone troopers can hit shit. Now, I'll tell you who Quinn, uh, the stormtroopers, and those are actually regular people. Stormtroopers weren't clone troopers. <laughs> All right, fair enough. <laughs> well, I've watched, you, an, you... I've watched enough of the Clone Wars that I'm not going to argue that the clones could actually shoot. <laughs> Even the Bad well, Batch could fucking shoot. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The clones could shoot. It was the, uh, it was, uh, the stormtroopers who can't. Um, but anyway. That's that's neither here nor there. And according to All Bill right. Barr, there was actually a Imperial sharpshooters that he was one. Oh wow, too bad. They're, they're, we never saw him in the movies then. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we get to, to the final twenty minutes, and uh, it's race time again. Uh, they go through their checklist, and Andy says she would never sabotage the car, so he doesn't have to worry. Machine gun. Uh, he overhears his pit crew talking shit about his face being all fucked up. So they were all obviously happy that he got, you know, the ass whipping of a lifetime, apparently. Um, which I guess I would be too if I had to deal with an asshole like him constantly. Right. And they're really joking and talking about how much they love Frankenstein and they hate being on his detail, which is what really sends him over the edge. Yeah. So, um, then, uh, Calamity, she comes over to Frankenstein and wishes them both luck, or him and Annie, and says, you know, I just really, we really gotta, I really wanna just let you guys know that I, uh, that, you know, good luck, and she actually thinks those two make a pretty cute couple. So, I was like, oh, that's nice. Good, good for you. Um, and then she tries to do the same with Machine Gun, and he tells her pretty much, in no uncertain terms, pretty much just go fuck off. So he's, again, just a dick. <laughs> right. Like, you get the feeling that she's in the race for the sex and the fame. You know, the, yeah. the everything else. The it, com- she's not even really that competitive. She just wants the attention. She's really not in there wanting to murder too many people, but she will. <laughs> right. Just because it gets her more fame and glory. Yeah, exactly. Right. So uh, then um, uh, so then the race starts and Machine Gun actually backs up into his pit crew, killing both the guys. And then they're driving and Machine Gun says he's actually going to keep Frankenstein in front of him. Uh, and he says he's already up on points anyway. He's going to keep Machine Gun in front of him. And that way, if there are any kind of uh, traps or anything, Frankenstein will have to run into him before he does. So not a bad strategy. No, if, that's... I mean, if you think about it. Yeah, that's actually a pretty good plan that Machine Gun comes up with there. If, the, if there are people out there trying to, you know, destroy your fucking shit, well, let's go ahead and keep, keep that shit, you know... In front of you. There's more kind of media reporting that's pointless. It's all fluff and shit like that. Uh, so then we see uh, some resistance fighters. They bury a landmine. And it's two guys. And then they take off on a motorcycle and they attack Calamity. And one guy jumps in uh, to her car, but she kicks him off. And then she spins the other guy who's on a bike off and he blows up. And then she stops the car right before it hits the landmine. And then she's kind of sitting there collecting herself. And then she sees kind of like all the other cars in that area are in wreckages. Just wreckage. So she decides to get the fuck out of there. And as she drives and backs up, she backs up over the landmine and she dies. So, sorry. (laughs) That was an interesting sort of like ironic death where if she didn't need to do a 72 point turn, she could have been out of there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that's true. If she didn't have to do the type of turn she did, she would have survived easily. Right. I mean, <laughs> the way that they had her do it, she backed up and like it was one of those things where you're like, oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, there it was. Oh, oh. oh there, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's, I love Terrible. Mary Warnoff, as you probably were able to tell by how excited I was that she's in the movie. So I was yes. sad to see her go. <laughs> Frankenstein asks for a drink, and Annie grabs it to him, and then, while she's not paying attention, he puts a pill in the drink, and then pretends to take a drink. And then he gives it to her, and she starts drinking it. Then we cut to the resistance group is going after uh, Frankenstein, and Mrs. Payne, Grandma Payne, says she's coming with. Uh, Annie passes out in the car, and Frankenstein sees a plane above him, announcing that they want him to pull over to talk to him. Frankenstein, of course, is going to do that, and he gets chased, and the plane's bombing him. Uh, 
The resistance now thinks Annie's dead because she won't take control of the car. Uh, Machine Gun is watching all this from away. And he's like, well, this is great. And he starts driving off. Uh, but some resistance members see him, but he's able to block or dodge their bombs or landmines that they're firing off. Frank is then, or Frankenstein is then chased by another car and he makes them miss and makes them crash and they blow up. And then he drives around so much that he makes the plane crash into a mountain. And we see the news comes up saying Frankenstein had killed the French Air Force. And so he got major points for doing that. And it's like, okay, he he killed he killed the French Air Force. All right, guys, let's let's no, just stop. No, it, right? not not all of the Air Force, but he killed the. It was an Air Force attack from the French Air Force, but he was able to kill them. So he was given an unprecedentedly high scoring point value, which is all double news speak, fucking Orwellian <laughs> talk. Anyway, yeah. I mean, true. I was just like, oh, my God. Really, guys? Come on. (laughs) (laughs) It's not all of the French Air Force, just this particular branch. (laughs) This this, these assholes. Yeah, we haven't seen a plane quite like that since we covered some Andy Sedaris films. There was a plane just like that in one of the Sedaris flicks. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. (laughs) So weird. Like, it has no wings, and yet somehow it stays in the air. Yeah, I'm like, well, how how does that happen? (laughs) Physics. Such such a weird fucking looking plane, but very cool to be used in the film. He also likes weird fucking looking planes. I mean, that's that's something we know as well. Yeah, this one was probably (laughs) a lot cheaper to hire to fly around for the day. Yeah, well. Well, that's probably true as well. Um, so then, uh, so then, uh, Anne wakes up and Frank, uh, Frankenstein tells her kind of what happened and that he, the reason why he drugged her is he wanted her to sleep through the attack and not do anything foolish. Uh, we see that he was hit by some of the gunfire, but he says he's going to be fine. And then grabs the wheel and tries to crash the car and he's able to stop it. They get out of the car and this leads to our next clip. What the hell do you think you're doing? It doesn't make any difference what happens to me now. Now that is the dumbest, sorriest thing I've ever heard you say. I don't believe you've got a drop of Thomasina Payne's blood in your whole body. The minute things get rough, you close your eyes and try to drive us off a cliff. If you just stop trying to kill me for a minute, I need your help. How can you possibly expect me to help you? You're my navigator. You're the only one who knows where you're going. I mean, whose side are you on anyway? I thought the only thing you cared about was winning the race. Sure. Only the winner of the race is to shake hands with Mr. President. Is that a grenade? A hand grenade. That handshake is all I've lived for for as long as I can remember. Now, wait a minute. I don't want you to die. It's my life's work. He's actually there to kill the president, and he has a hand grenade. That was so fucking corny, but I just went with yeah. it. I was laughing. Me too. Like, oh, that's so dumb, but okay. I, I thought it was fucking hilarious. Are you kidding me? That was the funniest fucking thing I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> Which is why he's always got the glove on there, because of that ridiculous looking hand grenade. Yes, he has a hand grenade. Come on. Why aren't we talking about this? <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Um, sure, that's a good word for it. There you go. Uh, so there's more racing and stuff, and then um, kind of uh, they're getting on. Uh, uh, Frankenstein's getting on Machine Gun's uh, tail, so he dumps a uh, Machine Gun dumps oil. And this causes Frankenstein to spin out, but he recovers quickly and is right back behind Machine Gun. As they keep kind of ramming each other, and ramming each other, and he actually takes Frankenstein's hand grenade and throws it into Machine Gun's car. And they blow up and die and destroy his machine gun with it. Well, um, they are driving and he, Annie says now that the, now Mr. President should worry now. Uh, so Frankenstein and Annie, they get to LA and they are the winners. When we see Frankenstein walk up to the president to shake his hand, but he is shot by Grandma Payne. We then see that this was actually Annie dressed as Frankenstein. Then Frankenstein takes the car, rams it into the podium, killing Mr. President and the crowd chants his name. We then come to a wedding and that is our final clip. President Frankenstein, dear friends of mine, can you tell us what your first official acts will be? I plan to pension off the secret police, restore free elections, end minority privilege, and move the seat of government back to New Los Angeles. The country has been governed from abroad long enough. Mr. President Frankenstein, is it true that you are now accepting rebels into your government? Well, since I have accepted one into my house, President Frankenstein has appointed my great-grandmother, Thomasina Payne, 
the view of her experience in the field as the Minister for Domestic Security. And I plan to deal very harshly with rebels. Anybody who is unhappy with happiness can go find someplace else to live. <laughs> what about the race? Oh, the race is abolished. Abolished? That's right. We feel that the country no longer needs this gratuitous display of violence to show the world that its virility is still intact. Right. But Mr. President Frankenstein, isn't it true that as a racer, your popularity depended entirely on violence? I'm afraid I shall have to let my press secretary answer that question. Stop annoying Mr. President with impertinent questions, Junior. It's the race, man. President Frankenstein, you can't call off the race. The American people won't stand for it. Get out of the way, Junior. The race is the symbol of everything we hold dear, our American way of life. Sure, it's violent, but that's the way we love it. Violent, violent, violent. And that's why we love you. Frank, do we have to listen to this? Be violent. No. And with that, they run over, Junior. Drive off. Roll credits. Really driving that point home at the very end of the movie. <laughs> what point? <laughs> <laughs> the whole violence is what we love. Violence, oh, violence, yeah. violence, and then we they love run violence over in to... America. The thing that I found the most interesting was there's always a party that opposes the party that's currently in power, and once yeah. the party that is in power is no longer in power, they switch gears and become the rebels. And the party that's in power is then basically acting almost exactly the same as the party. <laughs> that just lost the power. Yeah, did like did Grandma say like if you don't like it here, then you you have to find somewhere else to live. Right. Like, like she's like anybody who's not happy with happiness, <laughs> and basically they're saying the same governmental propaganda. But the point that they're doing now is it's not going to be that kind of presidency like what we had before. We're getting rid of all of this stuff. He's basically like doing things his way, but still not doing things necessarily the way that the people want, which is why they're getting rid of the race. Yeah. And also the fact that the previous party that was in power was called the bipartisan party, which means the party of no party. Oh, right. Yeah. No, <laughs> actually, very true. <laughs> it's just, it's really interesting sort of somewhat political commentary, which I think would get lost on most people that don't even have civics classes. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like we're the generation where civics classes disappeared <laughs> because of Reagan. So see, I got lucky. I still had a civics class. So. Right. Well, you probably had the same teacher that I had who was tenured and didn't want to fucking retire. So just kept teaching civics. <laughs> and only a handful Actually, of kids no, took it. All our civics classes, because you had to take them, they were all taught by usually, uh, the, the, uh, in my case, our high school gym or our high school uh, football coach. <laughs> wow, that's that's really got to be a weird way to learn government. <laughs> it really is awkward. Yeah. But anyway, the the plot line, the way that the film works and it, it lays out the plot line, it's basically setting it up where there's this horrible dystopian future government in power, but the people that are trying to take it over and are rebelling against it end up doing a lesser version of it that still keeps them in power and they still control it. So it's it's sort of like this little scathing satire on government's powers, what what's in control, misinformation, all of that kind of stuff. But it's also tongue in cheek and super fun in the way that it's doing it and it is ultra violent but it's also commenting on violence at the same time like it's just trying to do all of this different stuff and you just kind of have to ignore everything about the film that you normally would want to sink your teeth into and think a lot about and just have a good time because the more you try to think about it the more you start finding all these weird dichotomies and you don't know what line to take when you're trying to talk about it so it's just a fun fucking movie and have a blast with it because otherwise you're just going to scanners your brain and like you know blood vessels will start popping yeah uh, it really just it is a fun movie you just turn everything off it's nice it's sh you know short amount of time it doesn't you know drone on and on and on and so uh, i'm fucking i loved it just for that reason alone i'm just like oh my god thank god it's finally a movie that you know doesn't have to there's not a lot of padding like even in their um dialogue there's not a lot like when i was editing clips you there's not a lot of, there wasn't a lot of space to have to take out for it you could really just kind of enjoy it i mean and it, it it went quick and there wasn't dead spaces and there wasn't a lot of padding if there was padding it was cars racing you know going super fast so i, I loved it i liked the movie 
I thought it was fun. Yeah, it's a shitload of fun. But like I was saying, don't try to think about it too deeply because if you do, you're just going to end up hurting your brain. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's <laughs> because a it's a it's a barrage of all of these different ideas and imagery, and it just doesn't give you enough time to really let any of it settle or sink in. And the more you try to think about it, the more you find a counterpoint that the movie's making or breaking its own rule of morality in what it's showing you. <laughs> so it's just like, wow, there's, there's no point in trying to analyze a film like Death Race 2000 so much more so than just enjoy the fun and know that you're fucked no matter what yeah (laughs) that's what the film's trying to really tell you no no fucks given no all fucks given (laughs) and forcibly take it away yes that's also true (laughs) and with that we're gonna play the geek radio daily promo we're gonna have a little bit more music that fits in with the weird (laughs) overly hyper realistic ultra violent cartoony thing that is death rays 2000 and we come back we're gonna do some psyop news are you having trouble keeping up with the ebbs and flows of modern geekery is the real world holding you back from knowing what is happening in the geeky world To answer these and other personal problems brought in by your friends, gaming group, and loved ones, Geek Radio Daily presents daily informational sessions brought to you by the wonderful Billy Flynn, the Flynnstress, and podcasting's Rich Siegfried. They contain such helpful segments as history, geek birthdays, box office results, the latest in DVD and Blu-ray, video game and comic releases. Why, they also have a Sweekly show hosted by the wonderful Billy Flynn and the Flynnstress, which includes interviews and commentary. And to make sure you are informed, Geek Radio Daily also provides you with your daily dose of geek news to make sure you know more than that jerk know-it-all Steve. Visit us at geekradiodaily.com. That's right, Geek Radio Daily. All the geek without the weight. Now available in fine Corinthian leather. said it fits with the feeling i think with the feeling yeah with the feeling that you get while watching death race 2000 that's kind of the best i got right now (laughs) it's more than a feeling oh jesus christ stop that and give me some news. This comes from Robert. Our man in the field, Robert. Our man in the field, Robert. And this is kind of like uh, an uh, an update to a previous story. I knew you were going to pick this. I mean, come on. A follow-up. Man who married sex doll cheats on her with another object while she's being repaired. A bodybuilder who married a sex doll has put a video on Instagram showing him cheating on her with a strange-looking rigid object. All while she's being repaired. Yuri Toko, I don't know you, I'm not even going to attempt that. Uh, who is from Kakakistan, married his silicone love, Margo, in November. Afraid but somehow, vaginas. yeah, somehow just days before Christmas, she had to go to the sex doll doctor to be repaired. Shoot some fucking ropes. I mean, I mean, maybe that's what happened. Shorted her out. During posting a disturbing video with uh, his new bow, Yuri said, looks like I have a new passion. He must have vid- an incredibly long penis. I mean, it's possible. The video shows him lying in his undies, stroking what looks like a metal mask while making some strange noises. You one of his 99,000 ass as balls wiggled in and out. One of his 99,000 followers asked him, "Hey, are you cheating? On- are you cheating on your wife?" He replied with, "Maybe." 
adding that he can't stand while she's in the hospital. I'm going to kick shame you for the stabbing fetish, okay? That's I I I have to. It's like, come on. I mean, what are you doing? Dude, finally so, it's so hard, so now it's time to plow. <laughs> well, the pair were married in November, having been first due to tie the knot in March, but the coronavirus pandemic set them back, as it did for so many human couples. Finally, the wedding went ahead with dozens of guests in attendance. Speaking to the Daily Star at the time, Yuri said... Uh, she's broken, now she's being repaired, she's in another city, and when she recovers, it will be a gift for both of us. I'm advocating corpse fucking here. Back in 2019, local media reported that, uh, he was in a relationship with Margo for eight months before popping the question. Pulling it just to pull it. After going public with his plastic partner, he said he paid for her to get plastic surgery as she developed a complex. I wasn't gonna go Uh, shoulder deep for real. (laughs) Uh, he said he actually took Margot to a clinic, a legit clinic, meant to be used by humans, yeah, to get the some worst work done. Yeah, job ever. <laughs> and uh, that must have been an odd day for the surgeons who worked there. All blowjobs the, should be teethy. By the time he said, he, but, uh, by, at that time, he said that when he presented her photo to the world, there was a lot of criticism and she began to develop a complex, so they decided to have plastic surgery. She has changed a lot, according to him, and at first it was hard to accept, but he got used to it later on. It was at a real clinic with real doctors, Oh, he's said. looking for Wang. Uh, first, uh, she had surgery, and now she's at the repair shop. Uh, so she's not having a lot of luck here. I have the most uh, he, confused direction right now. He has previously claimed that Margot had a waitressing job at a local bar. Well, he said that she can't walk by herself. She needs help. Margot doesn't know how to cook, but she loves Georgian cuisine. Her favorite dish is... I'm not even going to pronounce that either. Uh, yes, you can't have sex by sticking an erect penis into a vagina. He also uh, ended it with that she swears, but there's a tender soul inside. Why are you coming in public swimming pools? Why are you coming in public swimming pools? So that wall, that's a pretty good idea. Oh, dude. Because Come on, it's man. Super hot, you should be able to fuck one time. Okay. I mean, roll tide. <laughs> Go jerk off in a Petri dish. I don't want to. God doesn't see when you do anal. I really don't think he does. I hooked up with a bad boy. Uh, oh, no shit. <laughs> I hooked up with a bad boy. I started doing uh, drugs after that. You fucker. I <laughs> hooked up with a bad boy. I started doing drugs after that. Hey, you want to shut me up? Suck my dick. It works. <laughs> now nah, you can keep talking. Uh, <laughs> Let's do another one real quick. Let's do another one. All right. Uh, uh, this one's from Al. That is Chef Al. Chef Al, uh, from the Insider. Police say Oregon man who stole the car with the child in the backseat came back and lectured the mom about parenting. <laughs> that cock and shit, it's like metal. I'm going to stockpile all my guns because cops don't help you. To hell with the police. The police at Oregon are looking for a man who they say stole the car with the child in the backseat. Only return the four-year-old and reprimand the mom about her parenting. All cops the are th- fumbling dummies. The, thief t- the theft took place outside a grocery store in Beaverton, Oregon. On Saturday, when the mom left the car running with the child in the back seat, local authorities said. America is a bunch of cunts. The mother left the car unlocked and went inside to buy a gallon of milk and some meat, according to Oregonian. Pulling it just Uh, to pull it. The thief happened to walk by, hop in the car, uh, the New York Post is reporting. And other he soon realized news. <laughs> he soon realized the four-year-old was in the backseat and pulled back into the parking lot, returning the child to the mother, but not without scolding her, according to Beaverton Police. I hate he actually, he actually lectured the mother for leaving the child in the car and threatened to recall police on her. A Beaverton Police spokesman, Matt Henderson, told the Organian. This is like uh, traces thie- of death fucked a porno. Old cops are bumbling dummies. The thief ordered the mom to take the child before driving off in the car. <laughs> Bobby- <laughs> Uh, he made Henderson. her take the kid yeah, he's, uh, take the baby the out car. of there and I'm still taking the fucking car but you're a fucking bitch <laughs> don't do that shit to your children <laughs> can you imagine getting scolded like that <laughs> what? when a fucking crackhead that just jumps in your car and steals it gives you a dressing down for leaving your kid in there that is yeah. peak fucking America America is a bunch of cunts that's gotta be the worst feeling in the world like you just get up and you're like well I guess I'm just the worst fucking parent aren't I <laughs> Aren't I? If that person is even capable of feeling shame for the choices that they've made that led them to this point. Yeah, I really hope so, but I doubt it. And she's probably going to leave the kid to go buy a lotto ticket as well. Um, 
so uh, he stated that um, uh, obviously we're thankful he brought the little one back and had the decency to do that, Henderson said. Uh, so there you go. That's fucking insane. Can you imagine some guy come rolls up in your car that he stole from you and then it's like, hey, listen, we got to talk about your parenting. All right. Because it's fucking horrendous. You can't pay your bail. Well, I could probably fix that for a blowy. It reminds me uh-huh. of that scene in the Gone in 60 Seconds remake where Chai McBride is driving the Humvee out and someone tries to carjack him on the way out of the parking garage and he kicks the shit out of the guy and he goes, he gets ready to like give him this big fucking lecture. Like you can see it like it's coming on and he's just like, what the hell? He's like screaming at him and everything. And then all of a sudden he just stops. He's like, you need a damn role model. <laughs> and, and the best way that Chai McBride can totally deliver that you know and then he just yeah. gets back in the car and drives off it was like the only part of that movie that stuck with me the most other than that's the cars fu- that's fucking hilarious yeah because Chai McBride's the <laughs> fucking man so yeah <laughs> I just a that's, role model that's how I picture it like the guy just comes back and is just like you need a goddamn role model and then just drives <laughs> off after throwing the baby at her how fucking dare you <laughs> oh, fucking thief who steals your I'm, car because you left the keys in it like a jackass and I'm your telling, baby, but brings your baby back. I'm, I should call the cops, lady. I'm just letting you know that. I should call the cops. <laughs> I'm not in shape, but I don't know how to perform an abortion. Uh, that's why I won't survive the zombie af- apocalypse, man. I have a Those ragey ver- direction. <laughs> Those very two big reasons right there. I'm already and, getting uh, arrested. I might as well grab this guy's dick. I mean, I'm just saying, if if you're going to do it, I mean, you know, go big or go home. All lesbians are preying on young women. Wow. What, what did that say? All lesbians are preying on young women. <laughs> <laughs> did you put that together or did I actually say that? Uh, that was one of the things where I think you were saying that the film is trying to show that. All oh, okay. All lesbians are preying on young women. But because you said that portion of it, I took it out because I'm a dick. Yeah, okay. Because, Jesus. <laughs> They'd be the lesbian vampires. Why would they want to put their teeth in man meat? Now that is a fact. I mean... <laughs> Why would they? <laughs> I was going to do another thing like I did last week and just be like, that's all the time that we have, but I still have to play the Ending Legion promo, so I'm going to do something else horrible to you and then do that. Okay, that sounds great. <laughs> so we're going to play the Ending Legion show promo. We're going to have a little bit more music that fits in with the feeling that you get when you're watching Death Race 2000. And when we come back, we will close out this weird show. <laughs> If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.
hopefully that invokes some kind of a feeling in you that you got into that at least some way, shape, or form out there, yeah. folks. <laughs> I'm still disappointed that I didn't have anybody actually like reach out and tell me that they got the weird reference I made about stabbing westward months and months ago. It feels like now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it might have been like two weeks ago. I don't even fucking know. Every day is a goddamn month this life. Yeah. Well, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if you'd like to experience all of our past month-long days and day-long months, we've got legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops. That is where all previous 283 episodes, which are significantly better than this one, possibly. Significantly? I don't know. Patently better? (laughs) I don't know. Maybe better. Kind of better. Sort of better? I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> somewhat more enjoyable at least your co-hosts are less exhausted from living in a hellscape for four years yeah yeah when you know, you're not getting over horrific shit and fucking living in this fucking horrid time frame that we have to fucking live in right now one of the places that will help you escape that feeling is our facebook group cinema psyops all right <laughs> We're still it will, with all their fucking outstanding memes and some really weird ones that I have no idea how they represent us or the show. But by God, someone gets it out there, I guess. Is, is it weird? That I find those even better. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> weird fucking memes. <laughs> hey, man, if you're enjoying it, that's all that matters, I suppose. I'm like, I'm like even more into it because it's fucking strange. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Tim and Eric t- style memes where I'm like, I know this is funny. I know this represents something. I just don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's like a giant palatuna for no reason. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> if you want to know what the fuck I'm talking about, you'll have to watch that show, I suppose. But also, I am Court Psyops on Facebook. You can reach out to me there if you want or don't. Whatever. I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or not, man, whatever. You're even my real dad. You can find Matt on Facebook as Matt Psyop, I should say. He may or may not get back to you, although you may have to screen cap and then remind him that he hasn't gotten back to you in months. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, fuck, you know, listen, I got mental problems, man. So you're making fun of somebody with mental problems. That's not very nice. <laughs> Yeah, um, alcoholism's not necessarily a mental problem, but I will accept that it's a disease. Oh, fuck. All right, fine. (laughs) I'm a lazy asshole. Is that what you wanted to hear? Well, that's what everyone knows anyway. If you want to email feedback to Matt and tell him how much of a lazy asshole he is, don't bother because he won't even fucking read it. He's that lazy. Psyopmatt at gmail.com. I was born to lead, not to read. (laughs) You weren't even born to lead. You were born to follow. I was even born to follow. I was born to get out of the way. You were born to meander. <laughs> yeah, <that> was... <laughs> you can email feedback to court, cinemasyopscourt at gmail.com. Tell him it's time to stop picking on Matt so goddamn much. Maybe that's why Matt hasn't grown as a person. No, no, it's really not. <laughs> don't worry about it. We're all good there. You can tweet a couple. I haven't, I haven't grown as a person because I don't want to. You can tweet a couple of tweets to a couple of twats on the hate-filled shit fest that is a little less hateful these days. That is known as Twitter. I'm at because Cor- you're only following porn bots. <laughs> I'm there as at court underscore psyop, and he is there at psyop Matt. That's part of it, but also some of the hateful people have been banned and jettisoned, and it's become so much more bearable to be about on Twitter now. But the porn uh, bots yes, definitely help. That is also very true. Yay! Fuck them. The show also has a feed that I run on Instagram, cinema underscore psyops. That's where all of the tasty memes that I have found about the internet and post and share there. So they're there. They're available. They're ready to go for you. Yay. Yay. All the memes. Who Uh, doesn't like a meme? Matt Psyops says he doesn't like any of your memes and he hates you all. I'm sorry. That's all the time that we have, folks. Kick the fuck out of this week and make it your bitch.
don't know. You're a loser. Hey. God damn. I thought it was just my inner thoughts speaking to me. Fuck you, Matt. Thank you. Fuck Matt. All right. <laughs> Fuck him. Fuck him. That's enough. <laughs> Are you recording on your side? I am now. One, two, three. Now double check your waveform because we don't want to repeat of what happened last week. What do you mean? Oh, you mean like I couldn't hear you? Well, no, like you weren't picking up your mic in the recording because you didn't. No, have... I am. It's It's got snowball shows. Okay. You're positive. You're good. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> God. That was awkward. That's creepy. <laughs> that is creepy. <laughs> All right, here we go. Ah. Wow, that was a weird Freudian slot. Right. <laughs> That's a weird Freudian slit, slut, slit. What? Fuck. <laughs> wow, you butchered that joke. Move on. All right, fuck you. So anyway. <laughs> you know it's uh, true. I know. Yeah, you're right. says he doesn't like any of your memes and he hates you all. I'm sorry, that's all the time that we have, folks. Kick the fuck out of this week and make it your bitch. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus, you really did fuck me on that one. (laughs) (laughs) Like they're going to believe it. That'll just make them love you even more. (laughs) Make better memes. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's call it a night. I'm fucking done. I'm exhausted. I have stopped recording.